Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lessons of the Woods by Ten Point Whitetails. I'm your host, Dylan Porter, and with me today we have our co-host, Kyle Weber. And uh, we got lots of fun stuff to talk about. This is your go-to podcast for all whitetail knowledge. Well, maybe not all, but you know most of it. We know a lot. Maybe not like how many molecules are in a specific part of a whitetail deer's body, but we got lots of good information here. We're going to share how best to help your deer this winter uh, today. And then we'll talk about what we may have coming up next in the next couple of podcasts. We reached out to a couple of few, couple of, couple of few. I don't speak English today. A couple guests that will be fun to have on, but that's for later. Uh, But we're going to start today with a fan question. We don't get these very often yet. We're hoping for more soon. Uh, This comes from Alan and he wants to know about deer family groups and how do they move? And how does that change from summer to winter? Uh, so in my experience, deer groups typically, cons- family groups typically typically consider of what's known as a matriarchal doe. She, there's one lead doe. There might be two or three other does and then their current fawns. Uh, but younger bucks often get kicked out as soon as they have antlers or shortly after, eh, before they even really have antlers. Most time button bucks get kicked out of the group typically right around April of every year, I think, uh, right in there because now the does are getting ready to have their new fawns. They don't need the old ones around. So they like, hey, you guys got to go get a life. As all mothers should say to their 18-year-old children, get a life, move out. Time has come. I don't know, maybe. Coming from the guy who lived in his mom's basement until he was 20. But, you know. Uh, but that's typically what ends up happening in my experience. Uh, if your deer population isn't big enough to have a, a resident herd of eight or nine deer, you know, and that's normally mother, daughters, granddaughters, and uh, the bucks just kind of get to force to fend for themselves a lot of the time. And then they'll form bachelor groups, which we've all heard about. Uh, but during the summer, deer tend to spread out more. Does are having their fawns. They don't want to be around each other as much. And you see a lot of grouping up in the winter, and that has to do with resources. So if there's a concentrated food source or even a good food source that's not necessarily concentrated, you'll see a lot of deer herding up or gathering up at that time of year. So not so much where you're at, Kyle, but where I'm at, we see a lot of deer in the fields on a particularly cold day. You'll see them at noon in a grain field, and they'll be in the good old days, you see 100 plus deer in a field, no problem. Uh, Now you'll see 30, 40 deer in a field, go two, three, four miles, different field, you see another 30, 40 deer, and it depends on, you know, if it's a soybean field where they spilt a lot or corn, soy or sugar beets, uh, depends what's able, what they're able to get at and what they find, but they do seem to yard up. That's the term that everybody uses. They seem to yard up a lot at this time of year and this time of year being January. Now we don't get quite as much snow, so that doesn't affect it as much here. We're sitting at maybe two feet in a lot of places right now up here. Uh, but down where you're at, Kyle, you or yeah, down you're south of me. Uh, you guys get a lot more snow. So have you seen anything that differs in your experience? Um, not necessarily. Actually, I was snow blowing yesterday, and the the berms, the the snow banks, which is just a clear cut with the snow the snow blower, are actually taller than my snow blower at this point. So. I'm going to say 36 to 42 inches of snow down to dirt. Mm -hmm. And that's compacted. I think we've gotten a little over 60 inches so far this year. Um, So once it falls, it compacts. But we're talking 30 some inches. That's taller than a deer or an average deer. Yeah, not quite, but it's heading there. Yeah. Their bellies are dragging. Their bellies are dragging. If they get put, what, what we do notice is this they're on the roads. They're on um, existing trails, you know, and if they have to jump off that, those little skinny legs with hooves shove right down as far as the snow can go until they hit their belly, and then they're, it's harder for them to get out. Um, I think we do see some yarding, too. I don't think we have near those numbers that you're referring to. Yeah. Um, I got a residential herd that I think is 9 to 12 on a regular basis. Um, I think the benefits to them doing that though, is 
they build these trails and these have these routes and the more deer that walk them, you know, the more concentration of the deer, the more heavy these trails are packed down and they have these exiting routes and, and ways to get away from predators and, um, cars and hunters. And, you know, obviously season's over now, but you know, they have enough escape routes and routes to get around to where they need to check. Cause if they're stuck in a 300 yard circle, they're going to browse that thing out in a couple of days. So, mm-hmm. um, I, on a hunting tactic part though, you talked about the mat- matriarch doe. If you want to get a big herd of bucks or young bucks in there, she's though, if you take her out, you kind of loosen the reins on your property as far as she's, she's kicking all the bucks out and yes, she's having fawns and yes, her daughters are having fawns, but they prefer to be bred by a buck of not their family. So a buck that cruises through and breeds them and then leaves. So she's shoving all those, those buck fawns away or or yearling bucks. Mm -hmm. So if she's eight, nine years old and you take her out, now there's no matriarch. All those does can have a chance to be her, basically. And now the yearling bucks that come in don't get shoved away. Um, maybe that uh, cruising buck can get in there and breed and introduce new genetics, new structure. You know, if he's a healthy, big, mature buck and house and he has a bunch of does, you know, the area is plentiful of does that aren't getting shoved away or messed around. Mm-hmm. He can breed all them and that can really introduce different. Um, I don't know about genetics. I don't know if you're going to get all of a sudden. Yeah. So I'm going to touch on that a little bit. I think there's positives and negatives to shooting your matriarch doe. If you can fully identify her, which isn't always possible, but typically there's one doe that's the oldest and the grandmother of the group. So and she's, half- usually the more, she's usually the more aggressive one. If you're watching the food plot. Mm hmm. And all these does, the fawns come out, little buck fawns come out. Then the yearling does come in. And all of a sudden this 200 pound doe comes out, walks to either your corn pile in Wisconsin or the middle of the food plot, walks out and everybody clears out of her way. It's a pretty good guess that she's the one, you know, especially by if you can, if you can base it off size, mm-hmm. body shape, you know, if you can identify an older deer and she commands the food plot, Sometimes even bumping bucks out of there. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty easy way to tell that she's she's that. Yeah. So, and during the summer, don't take that for granted. Uh, just because any doe will bump a buck during the summer. Yes. They're just going to. We're talking in the fall, if you got a doe that's bumping bucks, that's a different story. Because the bucks have hard horn. We've had matriarch does on my dad's piece where they would push all the yearling bucks out. They're like, nope. You Even when they have antlers, they're like, we're not... We're not going to allow ourselves to be bred by you. We had one particular time we put a doe in heat in with a buck, a doe in heat in with a buck to breed her, a yearling buck. And she said, no, I'm not letting you do it. She kicked him and he wasn't man enough to stand up to her. So we ended up putting a bigger buck in there. He actually, he didn't, we didn't let him breed the doe, but we put him in there. He whipped the doe into submission pretty quick, made her submit then we just swapped the box and she was like, oh, well, I guess this is, I, I'm feeling submissive right now. So, which was no easy task. It wasn't as easy as I'm making it sound, pushing the box away from does and heat and everything else. But we were able to pull it off because we wanted her to get bred by a very specific yearling buck. So your matriarch doe will, she'll do a several things well. She'll protect your herd. And what I mean by that is she's going to be more on the lookout because she's lived longer, she has more experience. She's going to teach your younger de- your younger does, your fawns, how to live and be safe. She's going to have her eye out for predators. She'll be the doe that busts you in the tree stand every time you're hunting. Sometimes it's good to keep her around, and a lot of times, if you're a bow hunter, don't keep her around because she just ruins your hunt, and it's no fun anymore. Uh, so push getting her benefits of keeping a matriarch doe, she'll protect your herd. And also with pushing out the younger bucks, it does encourage bigger bucks to come into the area because there's nobody here to take care of the does. And there's so many does, hopefully, where you can bring in those new genetics. So oftentimes if a buck gets pushed out of an area because he can't be dominant, they travel to find a little herd. 
right? Where they can be the dominant buck and take care of the breeding. So if she's pushing out all the younger bucks and they don't come back because she's mean, it can encourage new genetics. But if, if you have a matriarch doe that, it depends on the size of your property, different things, I'm getting off track. Uh, distant, so benefits keeping her, encourages new genetics, and protects the herd. Benefits of getting rid of her, Makes it easier to hunt them because she's not looking up in the tree every time you walk by, every time you're sitting. You're like, oh, what, what's that? I see you. Every time. I've had that happen. Super annoying. Really hard to get those does out of there. So you don't have that anymore. And like you were saying, Kyle, now she's not there to push the younger bucks away. So you can end up with a resident bachelor group, which will only stay until the rut. And then you'll have, you know, the biggest one will stay or the most dominant one. And then the rest will leave. But it'll help you. It'll encourage more bucks to live on your property if it's small enough where that matters, if that makes sense. So like at my dad's place, he has 20 acres right around the house that we don't really have a lot of buck traffic in, except during the fall, fall and winter. And the reason for that is he has a resident doe herd and the matriarch doe and all those does are so comfortable with the, everything that happens at the farm. He's had them walk into his grain building when the door is open. They're just like, oh, hey, is there food in here? What's going on? <laughs> they don't care. We can let the dog out. She, the dog runs around the yard. The dozer are there five minutes later. They don't care. If you have that, don't shoot any of those deer ever. You want to keep your resident doe herd there. We made a mistake one time, cleaned out the resident doe herd. We were like, oh, it's, we had five tags a piece. Let's shoot all the deer. We pushed that woods, shot all the deer that came out. We didn't have a deer in the yard for three or four years. Well, that was a mistake on our part because now we removed the deer that are comfortable there. So you want to have the deer that are comfortable there, staying there to bring in bucks to you. And then we'd use the remaining 60, 70 acres around my dad's uh, deer fence for hunting purposes. And the bucks would move through there steady to get deer pre, pre rut and post rut during the rut to get to that doe herd to check out if they're in heat and come back. So having a resident doe herd with a matriarch doe can be helpful if you have enough acres to do it on. Cause often they'll pick, a 10, 20 acre area where like, yeah, we don't really need to go anywhere else because our bedding is here. Our food is here. We're safe here. We've never really had a problem. We don't need to go. Does are much less likely to move than bucks. So when a buck's going on a cruise looking for does to breed, that's what he's doing. A doe doesn't necessarily need to do that. Now, that's not saying does won't move. There was one case in particular where a doe was found uh, two miles from where I'm sitting right now, three miles maybe. And she had a tag in her ear from a study done in Grigla, Minnesota, or Grigla, Grafton, North, Grafton, North Dakota, excuse me. So I, that's roughly 70 miles from where I sit right now. So she was tagged in Grafton and just took off and left. Now, why would she leave? Was the matriarch doe mean to her? Sometimes deer just don't get along. They'll pick on somebody and force them out if they don't like them. But that's nature's way of saying, hey, we got to spread our genetics out. Because if you have 10 deer on 20 acres and those 10 deer never leave those 20 acres and no deer ever come into those 20 acres, that's inbreeding and you're going to end up with some janky looking deer. It's just not how you want it to be. So nature is designed to have a way for deer to change up their genetics by being mean to one another, kicking them out so new deer can come back in. So be benefits of getting rid of your matriarch though, Encourages new matriarch doe, encourages bucks to stay on the property if she's really mean, and doesn't necessarily encourage kicking out other does. So it depends on the attitude of your doe. We've had some does where it's like, yep, she is mean. She's mean to everybody. Every time we step out there, she's she's running, makes it impossible to hunt. Got to get rid of her. Other times, like, she's really kind of an oblivious doe. She doesn't really know what's going on. We'll keep her. She's good. She's not pushing anybody out. She's nice, nice and kind natured. Keep that doe. Does that make sense? Yeah. And for example, like at wit's end, I'm talking an eight, nine year old doe. That's probably not in her prime anymore. As far as breeding goes, she is old and educated. She walks in and pinpoints the tree stand or the blind every time, mm -hmm. whether you're there or not, she's mm -hmm. looking at it, you know, um, and eliminating her from that allows the other does to become the matriarch or it become, it, you know, I, I'm not saying shoot a three-year-old doe and leave all the fawns to 
fast gas, you know, yep. how to survive. Yep. I'm talking to elderly, an elderly doe that has raised and, and produced many of does and bucks. When she's gone, the next one's five or six. So they can teach these lifestyles. And it's in into that, I want to touch on that point too. You have a bachelor group and there's one mature buck. He's, he's the dominant buck. All the other bucks are going to look at him. They're going to hear a noise and he's going to sit up and a dog barks, for example. He's going to put his head up and he's going to look around. Those other bucks are going to be like, what? And they're going to look at him. Is he going? Is he gone? Mm -hmm. No, he's he's hanging out. Okay, we're good. Same thing with the does. A dog barks, a gunshot goes off. The four-wheeler starts. All of the fawns, all of the little, you know, the younger does and bucks will look at her and if she stays, they're gonna they're like, oh we're good we're good she's if she's good we're good mm -hmm. you know, and that's educating them. So if she like you said a four wheeler starts up and she bails, she's teaching them bad habits for us. Um, if she's beating on everybody and making it just inconvenient, you want a bunch of people want you a bunch of deer on your food plot. You want to have that. You want to have that rotation. You want deer to come in and leave. More deer to come in and leave. That's how you. If, if three deer walk in, eat, and then leave at dark, you haven't had a successful hunt. Mm -hmm. You want rotation. You want them to meander. And that creates, you can see 20 deer without having to see the same two. So, for example, if she comes in, they eat and they leave. Next thing you know, the bucks come in looking for her. They leave. So that's kind of the process you want. But if she's a pain in the butt, she's teaching them bad habits for you. Um, it's a, it's probably a good thing to get rid of her, especially if she's beaten on every buck besides the dominant buck. Whether they're her yearlings, two year olds or not, if she's if she's commanding the space of the food plot, your bucks aren't going to want to come out the ones that potentially you want to harvest. We talk about shooting a mature resident buck, but if she's just scaring all the little bucks, two year olds away, they're not going to hang out there and try to eat. So they're going to move on, and then you now you've lost the opportunity at them. So you have you definitely have to paint the picture, like you said. Clearing out the the residential doe herd is not a good thing. It takes a while for them to come back and find the perks there. It is a benefit to having ten does, kind of just there, comfortable, know the routine, know the process of which you hunt and do your land that are feeling safe. Because during the pre-rut and the rut, the bucks are going to come in with only one thing on their mind. And um, they'll give him self-confidence that the place is okay. Yeah, because he's going to feed off of those does. So if they're not freaking out when XYZ happens, he's like, well, why would I leave if you're still here? There's no reason for him to leave, even if he's kind of scared of whatever happened. Yep, so and if, he's, if he hangs out, him and the other group, next summer you have a bachelor group of a residential buck herd. Now that get that 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 gets decided once they become hard horned and and some leave, some stay, blah blah blah. But if they're like, hey, we got bedding, we got food, she's cool here. Them ten does are cool here. Now even though we don't hang out with her, they'll hang can out hang on the out. periphery, you know. Yep. Two, yep. Three, and that's and that's what yards away. Yep. And you're creating that residential deer herd. That is what we want to focus on. We don't, we'll take it if we can get it, but we do not want to focus on shooting a buck that comes through during the rut and it's just a fluke. We want educated, precise. I want to call it two days ahead of time that it's going to happen. I want to, I want to know, I want to have control and, and read the room. Mm -hmm. If a big cruising buck comes through looking for does, I'm not saying I'm not going to shoot it, but that's not what I want to establish at the, at the land. So. No, your goal should be to have a resident buck population, resident bachelor group. Cruising bucks are just a perk. I mean, honestly, cruising bucks are a perk. Somebody else did the work and the buck left. And now you get it. Uh, yep. But your goal should be to have a mature dominant buck or two or three, depending on your population size, on your property at all times. That should be your goal. Yeah, you know and, right, and right now you're going to see what's left from gun season. You're going to see what's left from bow season. Um, cause, cause the bucks and does are going to, they may not sit in the, if, especially if you're feeding, they're not going to sit next to each other and eat, mm -hmm. but the same herd, the does will park their butts 300 yards away and the bucks will park themselves 200 yards away from the her. 
and they'll come in in different phases and, and eat, but they're all together at this point. Spring comes, there's browse, they're able, the snow is gone so they can actually move around. They'll spread out. The bucks will bachelor group. The does will start, you know, they're, they're producing a fawn right now. So they'll be getting ready to give birth. So they're going to, like you said, kick the young ones away. I got to worry about this. But the boys are over there hanging out in the bachelor group. They're just hanging out. And once the fawn's born, the doe might let some of the deer come back and hang out. But you'll have these separated, kind of segregated herds. Bachelors, bachelor group, and then the does. Which include the fawns, the yearling. And, and then like you said, April, May, those yearling bucks are now getting punted out. So they're going to go hang out with the bachelor group or get picked on and cruise to the next property or okay. farther farther than that. Um, fall comes, they get hard horned. Uh, bachelor group blow implodes. They all bail. Not right away, but yeah, at some point they all bail. Everybody goes their separate Open. ways, except for yearling bucks. They'll often hang yeah. out together still because they're stupid. So I had <laughs> six. I had a bachelor group of six, from ace to a to a spike fork. Mm -hmm. I got two pictures of hard horned deer. Never seen them again together again never boom gone everybody just scattered it imploded and that's now, crazy because when i was bow hunting i saw six yearling bucks all hard horned come one right after the other i did group. have i did hunt one night and had three forks um spikes come in together but not you know kind of that like you stay over there i'll stay here yeah um but any of the mature bucks i kept a couple and a couple left and then came back but um, but at that point, the does are just eating. You got the fawns, you got the yearlings, you got, they're kind of back to a group. So when the bachelor group implodes, basically, mm -hmm. you know, a mature buck will keep his buddies around as long as they know he's, he's the guy. He's in charge. If, they, if they're cool with being, and there's no number two, but if they're cool with being below, those three will stand around, but mm -hmm. we get to a five-year-old, he ain't going to have anybody, he doesn't want anybody by him. Um, and then, you know, the, the rut comes in, the pre-rut comes in, the bucks start chasing, they start establishing what their area is. So the bucks even get more pushed away from each other. Cause now the guys that were cool, Mr. Joe thinks he's, he, I can take him. Mm -hmm. They fight, realize he can't. So now he's booted from the group. You know, he's no part of, no part of that anymore. It gets to the point where they honestly can't even stand the sight of each other. Yep. They, they just hate it. But a, an older buck will tolerate a younger buck as long as they're respectful. And how can you tell if a younger buck's being respectful? A uh, common example, or a, not a common example, but an example I've seen numerous times, and I think about it all the time, especially at this time of year. So what ends up happening is if they're two deer walking down a trail and they meet, the dominant buck stays on the trail, the lesser buck steps to the side of the trail. And he stands there and watches the dominant buck go by. He's like, I'm not getting in your way. You keep you keep walking, sir. I'll 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 go over here, even though the walking isn't as great. So I think about that every time I'm on a snow trail right now, walking. I'm like, if somebody's in the way, neither of us want to step out into the deep snow. So who wins? Who steps out into the deep snow? The less think a think a high school walking down the hallways. Yeah, two people, the the starting quarterback of the football team and the point guard for. That'd be a bad example. Um, the, the number one wrestler, they're walking down the hallway together. There's no room. It's this big, and they're walking towards each other, and neither one of them steps aside. They bump shoulders. Now they turn around, puff their chest out. Who is dominant? Mm -hmm. I tell you what, the quarterback better step down because that rest the wrestler wrestlers are uh, they, they don't <laughs> they've had their they've had their face smashed too many times. Their brain cells. So, less but they turn around. Pain. Yeah, they, they turn around, puff out their chest, and that establishes dominance. And they're like, what's up? What's up, bro? You know? And that's – it's the same thing. I think it's subtler than that for deer, though. You can look at it, too. If if the six-pointer walks in, and I'm going to base it off antlers, even though it's not normal, but six-pointer comes in, and he's eating out of the, the um, bait pile or the feeding pile, whatever you want to call it. If he walks up, if the 10-pointer walks in, who's two years older, you'll see that six-pointer or fork go, oh, and just step off. Mm -hmm. Just step out of the way. Get don't I don't even want to be 
in the zone, and he doesn't even have to palm. He doesn't have to put his antlers down. He doesn't have to puff up. He just walks in, and that lesser buck. And then he might circle around like, "Hey, can I can I get a mm-hmm. can I get in there?" And they might let him. But you're giving up the plate first. You're like, you, "Sorry, I sorry I ate before you. Help yourself." And then if yep. there's left, I'll get it. So there's those subtle subtle tricks to that. And, and it's so simple for a mature buck to show his aggression without showing it there's it's very subtle so if there's if he's eating on the food pile and like in wisconsin where your food piles are only two gallons it's really close for another for another buck to come up in there all he's all the mature buck has to do is if that younger buck gets too close for his comfort is just go like this that's it and then the younger buck's like oh shoot sorry my bad i'll step off does come in they most time they won't even attempt to get in there at the same time but it's amazing what a dominant buck will put up with he doesn't like the bucks but he will put up normally with either a younger doe or something like that they can often come in and sneak and eat almost right inside the bucks handlers not very often but i've seen it a few times where there's one or two deer in particular where that buck's like yeah i don't care you don't bother me yeah yeah and i see that i see that at the house here you'll see you'll see a doe a matriarch doe walk up and everybody scatters even before she's got her head in there she hasn't had to palm she doesn't have to do anything they bail, mm-hmm. but also there's a buck sitting there in this little fawn yearling or a, a fawn doe or a fawn buck come walking up and just like, Hey, can I, can I get a little bit? Mm-hmm. And he'll be like, yeah. And, but you'll see her eating or, or, or the fawn eating and he'll lift his head. And she's like, she'll, she's five feet away before it, you know, she's like, Whoa, oh, mm-hmm. oh, okay. We're still good. All right, cool. And then she'll, then she'll rejoin. But we talk about, families and how these deer interact with each other that's i mean when you get to this point they're all trying to fight for food and they're good and you said it and i don't know the words to quote you but the hungrier they are the more they'll put up with Mm -hmm. that buck is hungry he doesn't want to fight everybody he just wants to eat Mm -hmm. if he can eat if he's eating he's not worried same thing i can feed him right behind the house here i have a bucket it's a two gallon bucket i set it down there was four heads in there they're touching. They're just their mm-hmm. their their noses are down, foreheads in there. They don't care. All they want to do is eat. So the, the, for the bucks, as soon as they shed their antlers now, which I feel we've had a lot of bucks shed up here. I think Brody and Gracie found nine sheds already. I mean, wow. we've had a lot of shedding up here, which means this winter so far hasn't been pleasant. Even with all the feeding we're doing, that many sheds, that cold snap we had where it got twenty below for a week in December, which almost never happens happened this year everybody shed i mean it was within two weeks three weeks after that everybody shed their antlers because it was so hard on them so now when they're when the bucks shed their antlers they have the testosterone level of a little girl there's a lot less fighting going on i mean it's significantly less fighting but yeah, and now the, and miserable and the matriarch doe has has the authority now if she remembers I don't care. yeah I, I don't care if he's 220 pounds at peak rut with a 150 inch frame antlers on his head. He's lost his antlers. He's been ran dry. He's mm-hmm. run down. He's tired. Now she's in charge. Mama's come home and everybody's got to listen. If mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, and then we wrote, then the rotation happens. We back to spring. They start growing antlers. I, I have a question. Do they have testosterone when they're growing antlers? Like we talk about the, t- the testosterone spike at pre and, and rut. We understand that once the velvet comes off, that testosterone's climbing the hill. Is there a spike with antler growth or are they still all very timid? I'm, I actually have, believe it or not, I might have this at my fingertips. Give me one second here. Uh, we did not prep this. We did not, we did not prep not plan this. this. But in the past when we've done seminars on this exact topic, okay, we've charted out a whitetail buck's testosterone. And I may just have a slide. I don't think I do. I don't think I do on this computer. Shoot, that was gonna be really cool if I had it. It's not there. I got one more place to look. Otherwise, I'd have to go plug in my I don't have well, it, but I so do have it. Some, I do is, have it though. somewhere. But what I was gonna say is, when a buck's growing their antlers, okay. So if we just say there's a baseline, right? So when a doe has fawns, their baseline testosterone 
Bucks, bu does are here, bucks are here. So they're equal. When a doe has fawns, she'll bump up one degree, whatever this amount is. And now she's above the bucks. Bucks have zero testosterone. You can't, a buck can't physically reproduce. You can't get a semen, a, a sperm count off a buck in velvet. They just have zero mm -hmm. testosterone. Testosterone is actually not, to my knowledge, one of the hormones that grows antlers. It has nothing to do with it. But then, so they're maintaining the does are just slightly above the bucks, and it's very, very marginal, just enough for the does to be aggressive. Once the, in the, in our area, every area is a little bit different depending on when your bucks shed their velvet. Once the bucks shed their velvet, now they climb way up, and the does will either dip back down or maintain. Normally, they dip back down. So at some point they meet. Now they're the same, but the bucks are currently polishing their velvet. And now once they skyrocket and then they hit a plateau, probably about a week before the rut, they hit a plateau that holds for two weeks maybe. And then they start a slow decline depending on their overall health. But once they shed their, vel to shed their antlers, it finishes this decline shortly around the same time frame as that to equal to or less than the does until the does give birth to their fawns. Now, testosterone might not be the 100% right word. Aggression might be better uh, because this is not a scientific data of anything we collected. You know, we're not taking and testing their hormone levels throughout the year. This is from my personal experience from what I've seen. This is how they behave. So aggression might be the better term than testosterone, but testosterone is generally categorized as the aggressive hormone. Yep. So their aggression levels change. So does a buck have testosterone whilst he's growing his antlers? That I'm not 100 percent sure. But but that's the, that's the point is they are they are not aggressive as the growth. They I'm sure they have testosterone. I mean they have to have some a, male hormone. As a male, they have testosterone, and they are growing antlers. I assume there's some, but you when you you have a good point with the aggression or the the dominance factor that varies mm -hmm. at that point and perfect example is a uh, scabby scabs scabberton um <laughs> which is the buck that i have now on the property he got injured i don't know if it was a vehicle a fence a predator but it, his hindquarters got tore up i would say really bad probably a oh, i mean it's pretty significant he would injury. Have definitely required a skin graft if he were human yeah yeah, and there was a big chunk hanging off. That is now since gone, so I assume it died and froze off. Luckily, it was in the winter, so infection may be avoided. But mm -hmm. he was the first. I, I had a, a picture one day. The next day, I had another picture of him. He had his antlers gone, and they both dropped. They're gone relatively early compared to any other deer. You talked about they shed based on their health. I assume he got hurt, and that cold snap happened. All the snow was coming. His body said, abort mission. You're not going to be aggressive. You're not going to be, you're not going to do nothing about nothing. You're not going to do anything about nothing. That's what you're just done. And they dropped his antlers mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to go find him next spring sometime, but he seems to be healing pretty well. He's visiting often. He looks healthy. He doesn't look like he's infected. He doesn't look like he's scrawny. So he's getting enough food. Um, but that we talk about dropping antlers early. Well, his body told him, the weather's going to get bad. You're not doing hot. Let's heal this. And, mm -hmm. and healing this doesn't affect, doesn't require your antlers. Yeah. So now next spring, let's say he hangs out. Let's say that's a scar or something like Dylan said, the ant the hair could be come back blonde or, or mm -hmm. discolored. It'd be curious to see how he grows. If I give this big abnormal buck that's got a scar in his hindquarters, you can tell that injury affected it. He might come back beautiful and he might grow and add 25, 30 inches of antler. That shows that that damage didn't do anything to his antler growth. It's um, typically a, a muscle damage flesh wound doesn't normally affect antler growth in my experience, but I've seen where a buck's missing an eyeball and it affected his antler growth, which that one's still yep. really weird to me. Um, well, and it's all about the skeletal, the skeletal body right now as a yearling, a two year old and a three year old, all their energy goes to their skeletal form. Mm -hmm. That's why you have this huge bump up in inches or antler growth after like three, four, four, five is because now all their energy, all their nutrition, all stuff, they're mature. Now it's going to go to their antlers to make them dominant or, you know, give them better um, weapons to fight with. 
Yeah. So right now, if you affect the skeletal system of a yearling, they're going to heal the skeletal system before they put it towards the antler. So he might decrease significantly. Now, I don't think this, like you're saying, a muscle injury, it shouldn't affect the skeletal system, but. You know, Every deer is well, different. It depends. It's it's really interesting to see how different injuries affect ant potential antler growth. So that yeah, will be something fun to watch. Yep, yeah, I think that's gonna be. We're gonna have a scabby update scabby. every season. Scab a scab scabby I don't update. Like that term scabby, scabby update. Better. Yep. Um. So I want to, if we can, transition to what's what's happening. What's new? Um. We got our catalog for Titan. Mm-hmm blinds they got a bunch of new accessories to their to their blind that's really they got swivel chairs the platforms they have a four foot ladder an eight foot ladder they have their new windows that were out last year um a proprietary window installation um but we got that new category or a catalog excuse me with all of that stuff so um that's exciting news. All the we so had the can, eight, can people start ordering now? Is what we're saying? Yeah, it, especially if you want to get them through Ten Point Whitetails, we can get them on a list. What the best benefit? So these things are from Texas. They're not. Wow. They're not. They're not from Wisconsin or Minnesota. They're from Texas. They're a rotomolded molded blind. So what'll happen is we'll get an order of eight. An order of eight will come in on a tractor trailer. We have one shipping cost with a, with a tractor. If we have to do four individuals, everybody's got to pay shipping on it. So what we'll do is we'll hold a list together as people call us and get them. And once we have eight, we order them and we'll start another list. And once we have eight, we'll order them. And if an oddball mid summer, we have three, we'll, we'll order them and the three will have to split those, those shipping costs, but it's beneficial to get eight and to get them early. But, um, so that's, if anybody wants one, and doesn't want to order it separately because you can call Titan. You can call Titan directly and order them. The problem is you're ordering one and you're going to get one. Mm-hmm. And as a dealer, we get a significant um, savings compared to buying one direct. And then we're saving on the shipping, so you, it can be cost effective um, to order them through us uh, in bulk. Now you have to order it and then wait to get it, but um, we'll have them definitely before the summer. Once we have eight, we'll order and that order will come up ASAP. So sweet. Um, ATAs happen. Archery trade association sports show, oh. which is tends to always be. It's in Indianapolis, I believe. But what happens is all of the brands bring out all of their new stuff, all the new blinds. Lone Wolf brings out their new stuff. You, the saddle, Hunting fad is still a thing. Some new innovation there. We got new trail cameras. Uh, Tacticam just brought out their new stuff, X Pro. Now photos can be shared on on Tacticam's app. So that ATA, I, I, yeah, I, ATA is kind of a big thing for the for the year for me because all the new stuff comes out, all the new products, and um, it's cool to see the innovation that people have. The saddle thing is just a fad. I the, Everybody is on that. They're making some crazy stuff, which I think is cool. I haven't jumped on that, but, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's cool to see innovation. It's cool to see yeah. the, everybody's showing their pitch. Everybody's got their food, their feed, their mineral, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota, are pretty much the only weird ones when it comes to no baiting in the Midwest. Mm-hmm. Or limited baiting, limit no feeding, whatever the flipping rules are. But we talked about you know, that. There's, there's a whole market. Yeah, podcast number. Go, go listen to our other podcasts. We talk about it extensively. Yes. So, but so down there they have a bunch of stuff. Uh, Monster meals down there, a bunch of mineral products, um, feeders, all of that kind of stuff for helping your herd. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's they're just booths down there. They're showing them. We have a. Former uh, expo or manager, manager, Organizer? owner, manager. I don't owner. know. I did, um, didn't go as good as I wanted it to. Could have gone better. Darn you, the D, darn the DNR. That's all I got yep. to say about that right now. Yep. <laughs> um, but so it's just it's just a big sports show, and it shows all the innovation. People will hold off Matthews, Hoyt, all the people hold their 
flagship bows for the next year till this point. So that was yeah. all cool. TikToks all over. Look up ATA. Look up the Archery Trade Associations. Look up the sports show in Indianapolis. You know, look it up. It's it, there's a lots of lots of cool stuff. And if you happen um, to be in the area for a sportsman show, go. It is so yep. much fun. I've gotten we so should, many over the years. We do need to go to one, and uh, we should talk about that at some point. I think there's one in February, but I don't know if I'm available or not that weekend. I got to find out. Uh, what uh, What else is What else is new? We're We're gonna have some special guests on the podcast. Yep, we're gonna have some guests on the podcast. Uh, I know you've talked to Jared from. I don't know the name of the company. What's, well, what's his channel? Um, Outdoor X. Outdoor X. So Outdoor he's. X. Jared, sorry if I'm murdering that. I'm pretty sure it's Outdoor X Media. They okay. got a group of hunters that they it's really it's really cool. They all self film. And after this year of self filming, I realized how difficult it is. But they all self film, produce, and then Outdoor X um, puts it on their platform and gives everybody their recognition and the videos. Great hunts. Jared's Jared's a killer. I, I like to think I can shoot some big deer. Uh, but I think he sh- I, he shoots big deer every year. Um, it's it's really exciting to see his hunts. So, but it's all self filmed. So there's not a cameraman following him around. There's no there's not a producer doing these like these bigger shows. These are all self filmed, mm-hmm. self hunting guys doing their work. Kind of what we've done once we get our hunts out there. But um, they're just doing it on a big platform. So he'll be a special guest. He's going to talk to us about how he kills his big deer. I th- I think the last one he shot was Lucky Seven. He's got a deer called Lucky Seven. He's got a deer called the King. And I'm talking 170 in. Jared, don't be mad at me, but there's like there's a lot of inches that he's put down. So it's pretty impressive. Um, so he's going to be on for at least one episode. Uh, I've been talking to some guys from Haunted Outdoors. They do a lot of self fil- or a lot of filmed self filmed and filmed hunts in central minnesota they do a lot of stuff uh great guys i've worked with them before and hoping to get all three of them on at one time uh and do maybe two podcasts with all three of them talk a bunch of hunting strategies uh fun hunting stories i mean they're they're all the time go check out go check out haunted outdoors they do a lot of fun stuff so that's coming up uh, probably end up doing some more s- releasing, not necessarily us doing a podcast with dad, but dad has now started stirring the pot in his special way, uh, and getting a lot of good, good information from people frustrated with wolf hunting in Minnesota or the inability to wolf hunt in Minnesota. And even somebody from the opposing side of the argument saying we should never hunt wolves. So we'll put that out as bonus episodes here in the next couple of weeks on here. What else do we got? I mean, that's a lot going on. Uh, I know we did have one other thing we wanted to talk about, unless you got some current or upcoming news. Uh, we did have one more thing you wanted to talk about. I don't remember what that was. You want to talk about how to best help your deer right now. So we did talk a lot about feeding uh, or about deer. Well, we got off track on deer antlers. and I mean, how so, you not, so but Here's the next two months. So it's January 20th right now. Next two months, February and March, are going to be the hardest. We, we have so much snow. It's it's, it's insanity. Um, February and March are the snowiest seasons for us normally. Mm-hmm. April, we get a bunch of snow, but it also warms up. So we get snow, melt, snow, melt. And then uh, May, it finally starts clearing up. So my point to getting the deer herd to May, that's what I want to do. A um, couple things that are good. Uh, with this snow, I will not be able to hinge cut in February like I wanted to. Uh, that's the only time I be- penetrate the sanctuaries. I wanted to expand them. And instead of clearing out like five acres and making it hinge cut sanctuary, I'd make it spotty. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. like 50 by 50 yards round, kind of hinge cut that, give it 20 yards and then do another 50 by 50 and kind of make this like, so that, that way they can travel through a clear area in between each one. Because when you hinge cut, you can hinge cut the whole thing, but they want something to their back and they want to be able to see out. Mm-hmm. If you hinge cut 100 yards by 100 yards, they're not going to lay in the middle unless you create traveling corridors through there. They're not going to lay in there because they're, they're trapped. So they'll do the perimeter. They'll do the first 10 yards hinging it, it, that are hinge cut and back up. So where I'm going to do like a 50 by 50 space, 
give it 50 or 20 and then give it 50. I'm making natural corridors for them. Um, normally I do that in February or I did it last year in February and it worked really well, but the snow is way too deep. I barely can get in there. They're stressed out to the max. I don't want to shake up their bedroom. I don't want to do that this year. So we're going to wait probably till the snow is going down. So late March, early April before we do that. But hinge cut cutting would be in my process of thinking right now. Mm -hmm. um, I just got my order. And thank you, Blake Davis. Shout out to you. I think he wants to be a special guest. And I think he wants us to be a special guest on his. Um, he is Monster Meal. He is the coordinator for Monster Meal, which is for anybody that wants to know, is a pellet, uh, half inch long, eighth inch round. It is, it is I should have brought the bag in. It is cr crude protein, calcium. Well, here, Dylan, why don't you talk about? How about this? <laughs> deer need how much in a controlled environment? I'm talking on the deer farm in a controlled environment. How much does a deer herd need for pounds? per deer or pounds per day to feed. I have about 10 to 12 deer that visit my feed, which is two gallon. Technically it's two spots, four gallons, but it's a two gallon spot. Um, how, how much the deer need? Yeah. So it, it depends on the material you're feeding. Uh, but weight wise, uh, a few years ago we had to, or attempted to uh, slim down our does because our does were too fat, we're getting too many buck, too many doe fawns from our doe herd, and that's something we've talked about in the past too. Healthy does have, the fatter your does are, the more likely you are to have doe fawns. So we wanted more buck fawns in our area, or in our farm. So we slimmed our does down prior to breeding, so we cut back their grain rations and put them into a pen that had no forage in it. So to do so, we were feeding them two and a half pounds a day per doe, was our measurement. And that's to slim them down. So a deer wants usually between three and four pounds of grain per deer per day. And that's just an average. You know, your bigger bucks are going to eat more. Your fawns are going to eat less. But on average, they want four pounds per day. So if you have a deer that's eating just strictly grain, that's four pounds. Otherwise, that four pounds has to be substituted with forage, with leaves, with whatever they can find, twig ends in the winter. Twig ends. So yep. when you're only able to feed four gallons a day, and now if you're feeding four gallons of straight corn, that adds up to roughly, what did we say earlier? Uh, a five-gallon pail of corn, if my memory is correct, is right around 18 pounds. So you're looking at... It was, it was seven and a half pounds per do, two gallons. So okay. 14 to 15 pounds if you're what? doing four gallons. If you're doing four Four gallons, gallons is only if you legally have 40, two 40s, and they're 100 yards apart in Wisconsin, you can do four gallons. Read the regulations, guys. Make sure you know exactly what they mean before you do yeah. anything. So we're talking 14 to 15 pounds I can per day. According to how we understand the regulations. That's seven Note to eight sarcasm. Yeah. So you're, you're feeding seven and a half to eight pounds, right? No. 14, no. 15 pounds, excuse me. Yeah. So you're feeding about 15 pounds a day, which if a deer fully wants four pounds of just grain, for easy ease of math, let's say you're feeding 15 pounds, each deer is eating roughly three pounds of grain a day, you're feeding five deer yep. sufficiently, or you're inadequately feeding 10 deer. Yep. Which you said now, earlier, you have maybe 10 deer on the 10 land. 10 to 12, yeah. Which in your area is probably all the deer within a half mile. Yeah. I'm, so. I'm guessing we're, we're, we're condensed down to them, you know, there you but that's the, up. you think about if we weren't doing that now that, that you, they say, we're well, not doing much. You're barely feeding them. Like you just said, mm -hmm. per, per the math, you're barely giving them anything. Imagine if you weren't giving them anything, they want two pounds of twig ends. And that is a whole point of hinge cutting is it brings these tops and this growth down to, browse level mm -hmm. so like all the hinge cut last year grew all those browsable areas are there this year i'll hinge cut more more browse i'm mm -hmm. hinge cutting more more browse that's it that's the process you're providing browse because they technically want two and a half pounds of food a day well they're not going to get that and that's there. a minimum that's to slim 
So and I imagine if we weren't doing that at all, and they wonder why we get winter kill, mm -hmm. why the deer herd has a hard time in the winter, you know, hard winters, because yes, four gallons a day isn't enough. It's not. No. But if it wasn't there, there also wouldn't be enough. Um, so what I want helps. Every little bit helps, and if it saves, if it saves six of those ten deer from a winter kill rather than die, losing all ten. I'm I'm that much better than around. So but, I just I just thought of something really stupid to circumvent Wisconsin's baiting laws. So if you took your buddy, okay, and you went out to your food plot and you have your food pile, but let's say you sold him for one dollar a ten foot square. Now he can feed oh. on his land. Yes, technically. Because technically where I live, we're all acre, acre and a half chunks. Mm -hmm. And everybody here feeds the local herd, their pets. Um, but there can be a two-gallon bucket on every acre. Mm -hmm. Because supposedly that's not that's not worse than me feeding more than two gallons per 40. But it's allowing everybody to feed. So if yeah. you just went out to your food plot and you got 10 buddies, you sold them a 10 square foot for a dollar with the agreement that you get to buy it back. At the end of the winter, like May Every 1st, April? you get to buy it back. The paperwork will yep. be a nightmare. But theoretically, you could have 10 two-gallon two piles. You yep. just have to make sure they're out, you know. I It would technically work. Yeah. If you guys are really desperate, go so, feed your deer. But here's, a, here's, another, so here's another thing. We talk about back to Monster Meal, mm -hmm. okay? Monster Meal is a pellet that I bought. It comes out of Tennessee. It has, and I want what I, the reason I wanted to go this way was because I want to read this stuff to you. Crude protein, 16%. Lysine, uh, six tenths of a percent. Crude fat, 4%. Crude fiber, 9%. Uh, calcium, 1.5, phosphorus, uh, six percent or six tenths of a percent. Salt, 1%. And then we get to minimums. It's parts per million, blah, blah, blah. But it's potassium, magnesium, copper, uh, mag, mag, manganese, so, selenium, 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 zinc, vitamin A, vitamin D, and vitamin E. And all those are parts per million or units. How many parts per million is a selenium, out of curiosity? Uh, 0 0.30 parts per million. That's what it should be. That's funny. So... so Hold on, hold on. Okay. Hold, on. hold, okay. hold that. I'm holding. So the whole point, what I do with Monster Meal and I take some deer feed um, from White River Egg up in Mason. Shout out to them. They've been a great, we got good things working with them. Um, but it's it's corn, it's sunflowers. They got a bunch of stuff in that also. Uh, the deer love it. So do the birds. But I mix that about a, a bag to a bag. So a 50 to a 50 mix that up and that's what i take out there four gallons at a time basically every other day that i can get there and i feed the deer that so that that is my tactic to try to help these guys because the pellet's really easy to digest it's got all of that in it so if we're talking pure poundage for example if i could do a 50 gallon drum and fill it with 600 pounds of food like they're going to get tonnage out of that where that I could compete with four pounds per day per deer. I could compete that way, but I give them that to benefit what, what they get. I mean, like you're, you're about to tell me about these percentages and tell me about these, this volume, but corn. So hold on ABC sportsman club, which is Ashland Bayfield County sportsman club mm -hmm. just set up their feeding um program this is the second time i've seen it i think in 2012 they did it where we got a bunch of snow right away in the year the only difference was we got a bunch of snow first thing in december and then it basically didn't snow the rest of the year <laughs> but they set up this feeding program and basically as a club they buy tonnage of corn if you're a member you get it at half price and that's an incentive to feed your deer because if we don't do anything and we do what the deer in our wants to do, we won't have deer. You know what, so Minnesota? I'm, not a... I'm going to interject. Minnesota has a deer feeding program. Did you know this? 
look back at our last two podcasts. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But they don't use it. Or Steve, maybe it was in did, Steve's did video. Talk, he, I think somebody's talked about it. But real quick, yeah, a percentage of every deer license sold in Minnesota is for emergency winter feeding for the white-tailed deer. They've not it used it. goes into account. It goes right into the DNR's pocket. They haven't used it since yep. 1997. Have we had a bad winter, Minnesota, in any of the last several years? We have more snow this year than we normally have. Two or three years ago, we had so much snow, it was ridiculous. Never been done since 1997. Yeah, your dad did the math, and it was like five, six hundred thousand dollars. That's probably just sitting there that they're spending that they shouldn't have because they just pocket it. They it should they go back to the hunters. But that's besides the point. We're talking about Monster Meal. You're talking about ABC. Yep. Sorry. They, so they just no. It, it's a good point. The DNR have a feeding program. Mm-hmm. They don't mm-hmm. implement when they should. Maybe right now they should be doing it. Now Wisconsin. There's a private club using their funds to implement a feeding program to incentivize people to feed. I am not part of that ABC Sportsman Club. Maybe I will be. Maybe 10-point white deals will be. I'm not. I'm doing this period out of my own pocket. I'm doing it out of my, on my property so I can have a deer herd. But that monster meal and the mixture of deer feed gives them some tonnage. Even if I'm getting a deer one pound a day, it's one more pound or one pound a deer a day per whatever, it's more than what they'd be getting if I wasn't there. And if I can save half my deer herd from a winter kill, I think it's 100% worth it. But selenium, selenium, talk so, to me. Well, first to cap off what you just said, think about it this way. If you are starving and all you get to eat, let's say, is lettuce and celery, but you get one granola bar a day, that granola bar is going to make a world of difference. Because celery is negative calories. Lettuce yep. doesn't do anything. Or let's say you get one 8-ounce steak a day. You get one 8-ounce steak a day. Now, you're still hungry. But if I took away that 8-ounce steak, you'd be pretty mad at me. Unless you're a vegan. But that's somebody else's <laughs> issue. Uh, They're so not watching our podcast. Definitely. Most likely not. Be surprised. If you're a vegan, give us a shout out. We want to know. We get to see all sorts of metrics when we post stuff. Uh, but they don't say if anybody, any of our followers are vegan. So give us a shout out. We'll see. Uh, but anyway, so it's really interesting that they put selenium in there because selenium is important for antler growth. However, it is highly regulated because it's severely dangerous in large doses to most animals. So 0.03 or whatever it was, parts per million is the, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, but that is the maximum amount you are legally allowed to put into a food source. We were feeding into a food source you're selling. That's different. We sure. were feeding 0.06. So we were feeding double to our white-tailed deer herd. We didn't know. <laughs> this is where we made a mistake. We didn't know it was highly regulated and is dangerous to a lot of animals, but white-tailed deer are able to process selenium at a higher rate than most other animals. So there was a time period where we would milk goats to bottle feed the fawns. And we are like, oh, goats can have deer feed. They're basically the same. Actually, a goat and a deer can actually breed, but the offspring never survive. But there can be a pregnancy. I'm not sure which way is which, but the gestation periods are just different enough where the offspring never survives. They're close enough. It's weird. So we're like, oh, we can just feed our goat deer feed. We killed like three or four goats before we realized that they can't have that much selenium. Sure. Deer can process it. They goats can't. can't. And what would happen is their hooves would grow. You know, they wouldn't stay nice. They would grow like bad, like banana feet. We're like, what is going on with our goats? And their joints would get all swollen. They can't handle the selenium. So, and that selenium in, in uh, how promotes antler growth. Is that what, that's it, what you're saying? It, it, it's a necessary material. I don't know how much it promotes, but all of the things that you lifted off, listed off in there, we've fed in our deer feed. So, but so I, monster I, meal. I will say one other thing. You are technically wasting it at this time of year if your deer have been getting enough of it all year long. So they build up nutrients within their body, right? Their their bone structure, they build up nutrients and hold it within their body. When they start growing their antlers, they start depleting that. When they calcify the antlers, they deplete their calcium sources way in their body. Their bones become brittle for the first week or two after calcification, okay? We've had bucks break ribs. We've had a, we had a one buck broke his whole shoulder blade because his bones became brittle immediately upon calcifying his antlers. So having that built up in their system is good, 
but we would actually quit feeding our high quality mineral and we, we quit feeding it uh right up until I'll be right back. this time i got a year. dog i got a i got a black lab that needs something i'll be right back okay so while he's gone he'll maybe hear me when he get, he'll he'll hear but we quit feeding it right up until typically we quit right about november right because the bucks are done growing their antlers at that point they're done breeding we can kind of wean them off of the good mineral so we quit the good mineral and then the does we'd actually put onto a good mineral end of february somewhere in there so we just feed them all really well throughout the winter but we put them onto their uh good mineral towards the end of february we put the bucks on it in towards may and now everybody gets a good mineral while they need it the most. But in Kyle's situation, when his deer haven't had access to that type of mineral all year, it's better to uh, start building up their system with those minerals now as opposed to later. So build it up in their system so they have access to it when they need it. From the brief overview I heard of the Monster Meal, it sounds like an excellent product. It's probably very similar to what we were feeding in a pelletized form. And I think he's on his way back. So, but it sounds like a good product to, from what I understand. So that's good for Kyle to be feeding that to his deer. I actually need to start feeding my wild deer herd as well with some of the issues we've been having right now with the snowfall and everything else. But I don't have a lot of deer in my property because I only have 32 acres of not very, very fenced prop or not very fenced, not very wooded area. So I have a few deer that trickle through, but not many. So, so I, I missed a little bit of it, but you talked about, basically year round yeah so when your deer are lacking you might need to feed year round at first but once yep. your deer are no longer lacking then you can cut back to uh like i was saying you could actually just start feeding your herd end of february or so with that good stuff and just give them something to get through the winter because they're yep. not necessarily using it at a rate faster than you can provide it to them right now they're not really using it at all because they're in a maintain mode Yep. Right. That makes sense. Right. So basically what I did, I'm handicapped by four gallons basically. Um, but what I did was I bought basically a ton of deer feed, mm -hmm. the deer mix, and I bought a ton of monster meal. I mixed that 50 to 50. So I have 4,000 pounds of feed. Okay. You're going to dole out seven and a half pounds at a time. Yep, pretty much. But what'll happen is I'll do that till it's done. That'll end in calculation was like June or July or something like that. I'll feed them that till it's gone. You and have then I'll be done. you have two hundred and sixty days worth of feed sitting there, right? At the rate exactly. you're allowed to feed it, right? So it's gonna, I mean, it's gonna go until it's out. I'm gonna run out. And I won't, and then next. I'm really trying to set up the property where it does not get bait. I don't want to bait on the property. The whole development of it is not to bait. Food plots and natural brows and natural grays, that's what I want. So during the hunting season, I'm pretty... Besides the fruit trees and the food plots, I don't want to add anything to the property because I think it changes how the deer function on the property. And you're also preparing for it. It's, it's in the pipeline. Wisconsin is not going to be able to bait for too much longer or even be allowed to feed for too much longer five so, five years from now it's going to be no baiting no feed no nothing so so set your property up for out without to not need it because like in minnesota yeah. we just can't do it in a lot of minnesota you can't feed at all so the goal is set your property up so you don't need it it's yeah. good to have so, but if you don't need it you don't need it right so then through hunting season there's no there's no addition on my behalf besides the food plots and then I try to ramp this back up. Basically, I started feeding mid-December, early December, but like right after hunting. And, that, and the reason I did it early in December was because I was done hunting. I wasn't actually, rifle season had come and gone. I was done hunting. Mm -hmm. So nobody could be mad at me for baiting deer. I was purely, it was purely for a feeding benefit. Um, but usually you wait till after deer season, which was on the 6th this year, 9th this year for us. So that's when I want to kick up the feeding so that nobody can get mad and say, oh, you're baiting your deer. No, I'm not. That's fine. But I'm doing it for health. But I'll go until it's done. And you said 260 days. There it is. So I'll do it till it's gone. I won't do anything during during hunting season. 
they'll have the food plots to to survive off of. It's not quite year round, but it's 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 close enough. It's going to help. And it and I was really pleased with the nutrition label that you provided me with with that monster meal. A lot of it made really good sense. Uh, the manganese is important. They've actually, if I remember correctly, they they cut open uh, and tested the mineral components within a deer antler, and manganese is actually surprisingly high. So that's a good mm. one. Uh, the calcium levels are good. The A, D, and E is good. That's just for overall body health. But another one that was really interesting in there is copper. So yep. dad did a test this year. His, feet, his deer, they always look good, but you never know if your deer could be lacking anything. So I think it was... It was probably fall of 21. He took a harvested buck and tested the liver. So for those of you out there that are hunters, which should be all of you, if you wonder if your deer are missing anything in your area and what you can add to better feed them, take the liver on a harvested animal and send it. I think he sent it to the vet and they did a, I don't know the name of the test. I would have to ask that again, but it's like a mineral test. So they test and see what minerals your deer are lacking or the, Creature whose liver it is is lacking. And dad's yeah. deer surprisingly came up lacking copper. So he added copper to his deer feed and it changed his deer. They're better than they were last year. He had a higher fawn survival rate. Bunch of things changed just by adding one mineral. Yep. And then, so monster meal, again, pl- I mean, I'm plugging, but Something that 10 point white tails when me and Dylan started talking from the very beginning was not, we're not going to get partnerships on just people that are going to give us free product or help, uh, you know, promote it. We want to do the stuff that we already use. Titan blinds. If you went to wit's end, you're going to see a Titan blind. TR outdoors blinds. You're going to see a TR outdoors blind. The monster meal is now in my garage. The deer mix from white river egg is on the trail. I mean, Mm -hmm. We plug them, but it's because we trust them and we use them. And same thing with our seed, domain seed. Domain seed is what we plant. We're, we're using that. Mm-hmm. So we may plug, but it's not. They didn't, they haven't paid us yet. Nobody's paying us yet. They, they haven't paid us yet to say their name. It's the products that we use or we recommend or we we trust. So um, Monster Meal provides deer tractant, uh, which is a... It's, it's a mixture. It's got some corn in it and stuff, and it's meant to be just, just basically dump it on the ground, and it's, it's a bait pile. They have a protein block, which is a, a, it's a two-gallon block. They're smart that way. Mm. Uh, 25 pounds, and it's, it's got a bunch of um, similar ingredients to the feeder pellets. They have the feeder pellets, which is what I use, which is, a, which is the pelletized. And what pelletized feeder pellet has is most of all of that. When you get to the mineral, it's more focused on like the copper and the magnesium and, and less about the crude fat and proteins. Cause it's, it's the mineral that you would mix in with your, your corn or whatever you're feeding. Um, we have, let's see here, protein block. They have a mineral block, which again, no, no fats, no proteins, but it's just the mineral. And they have a mineral supplement that you can mix in with your deer feed. And, and there, if I, if it'll load quick enough, like the ingredients are a little different than the feeder pellet, but I wanted crude fat, crude protein. That's what I wanted for the fat. My and protein is huge right now. And, and, uh, I think when we were feeding our, we're mixing all of our own feed. I think we tried to aim for 18% protein. So okay. 16% is right there. It's right. I mean, it's, it's same as, thing. It's as close and it's not, and that's not per pound. That's because I'm, I'm basically cutting that in half with the deer with the deer but the, the deer mix has corn and sunflower seeds and a bunch of stuff yeah, um the mineral good. supplement what's that corn's good yeah it's good it, for deer yep uh mineral supplement so the mineral just the mineral supplement that you'd mix with your feed calcium 12 percent. phosphorus salt magnesium potassium sulfur copper uh magnesium sel- selenium zinc Why? vitamin a vitamin d vitamin e so it's it doesn't have the crude fiber it doesn't have the crude protein but it does have a bunch of other stuff that if you mixed it with your corn or your deer mix that's where the proteins and fats would be um added to that mix but they they provide a a ton of different stuff plus some gear so i appreciate blake we actually lost this shipment it was heading to mexico 
Blake got on the phone and the next day was at my house. So, wow. um, now, but it just seems so silly to be putting out four gallons a day for your deer, but it's something in a place that you cannot feed over that much. It is something. Um, if I could take a, you know, a bucket and go dump a bunch of beet to aliens legally, I'd, I'd be a hundred percent doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but besides feeding, I do have a camera out just to check on the deer herd, see how they're doing, see how many deer I have. Trails. We, me and me and my son went and walked all the tra- not all the trails, but we walked a bunch of trails up into the sanctuaries, up until the bedding. We stopped and okay, now I can see where they're cruising. And a good thought for that, and the reason I would do that, if on your property is right now, it tells you over time where deer walk, where they walk right now. In essence, is where they'll walk during the summer. Mm-hmm. So if you see this main trail that's two feet wide and just getting really packed down, but then you see three little trails that have some trails tracks in them, you can tell this is the main road. Them are little jetoffs. Mm-hmm. Don't set your tree stand on the jetoff. Set it up on the main road. Or if you notice they they walk this way, well, why do they do that? Well, that's because they come up the hill and they can see everything. Walk those trails and look at your tree stand. Or look at your access. Look where your side by sides part. Walk those trails and see what they see, because now it's telling you over time where they use it. Mm-hmm. If that buck is walking a trail from point A to point B, bedding to food. If that buck walks down the main trail ten times, but then that one trail one time, where should you put your tree stand? So all those little things you just kind of look at, you pay attention, and and the snow tells you a lot. As, my, as bad as it is and how, how hard it is being this year. Um, it's kind of scouting yep. season. Yep, yep. Can. But I'm staying out of sanctuaries. Like I said, normally in February, I'd be in there creating more. But with the pressure they're under, the snow that they have a problem with, it's gonna, my life would be horrible trying to get in there and, <laughs> and do it. Um, and also with four feet of snow, if you hinge cut at your hip or your chest or wherever you, wherever we want to hinge cut at, the snow melts. It's gonna be this. It's gonna be six feet in the air. So, I'm gonna. That will be postponed. I'm just gonna let them sit, let them enjoy their, survive their time. You know. So. Yeah. So do what you can to help your deer herd. Walking trails, scraping down so they can see the dirt in places. Give them access to minerals. If you're not able to feed minerals, that's all good. If you can provide a water source, that's huge. But providing um, one is tough. So there was a gentleman that commented. I, I found, I went up to my pond and you could see that the deer were breaking up the edges of the pond to get some water. And actually your dad commented and said, did you know they want to eat dirt? They want to get copper, magnesium. There's nutrients in that soil and in the, in the greens that are under there. But I said, I'm going to take my auger and go drill a couple holes to give them some water. Even though they'll ingest a lot of their, their water right now is via snow. And a lot of their water during the summer is via the plant. Mm-hmm. Busting a hole in the pond does help. They were they were digging for it. They were using energy to break up ice to get to water. So I said, I'm going to use the auger and help them out. And this gentleman's like, oh, yeah. Go up there and start up your auger and, and scare all the deer and make them run 400 yards and burn all those calories. That's really worth the hole for water. I want to explain that real quick. One, I always use the side-by-side. They're used to that noise. They're used to the startup, the drive for all of the leg work this summer. So they shouldn't get scared and run away. I'm going to do it during the midday when they're in their sanctuaries. Mm -hmm. The sanctuaries are specifically put a distance away so that me working on the food plots doesn't affect their sanctuaries. So I'm going to start my side-by-side up. That's a noise they're used to. I'm going to drive up to the food plot, which is far enough away from the sanctuary that they should be used to that noise. I use the side-by-side to set the feed, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to go up to the pond, which is in the food plot. I'm going to drill a hole with a Makita and a K-drill. So it's electric. So all you're going to hear is... And then I'm going to drill a hole. So I'm not lighting up a Jiffy gas power two-stroke and letting her wind. So... And for people to think that a deer, every time they hear a chainsaw within a half mile, they take off running, they don't do that. Guys are out brushing their lanes, 
all year long. You could step outside any day, pretty much any day, in a wooded area in the summer. You're going to hear a chainsaw at some point. Because yep. they're... Deer hear this all the time. It's not it's the about first time they're hearing something. They're conditioned to hear this. And plus yeah. your property, your food plot's 400 yards off a of highway, 300 yards off a of highway. Yeah, quarter mile, 400 do, yards. Do, does does anybody ever drive a four-wheeler or a two-stroke dirt bike down that road? Yeah. I was say no, they legally can't. The, asterisk. They legally cannot drive a dirt bike or a side by side down the highway, but to your answer, yes, they do. <laughs> Deer are used to all of this. It doesn't bother them. Is there a neighbor kid within a mile who's got a two stroke dirt bike? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Deer don't care. So, so did his argument saying I was detrimental to do what I was going to do? I just want everyone to understand that there's the whole process is thought through to be as. Low impact. least impact yeah low impact impactful as we possibly can i pulled up the one day with my side by side the deer were in the food plot it was noon they were in there i'm like oh hi you're not supposed to be here mm -hmm. ran away i left the side by side running i did my thing i turn around she was coming back in with her fawn she wanted to come back in but then i was behind the side by side so she heard the humming of the motor mm -hmm. and didn't care she looked up, seeing it was me, and she was like, I don't like this, and bailed again. But the side-by-side the -side is the least... It, besides it chasing her down, she does not care. So I would have... I did that whole process with augering out the water and doing what I said. As little to no impact as possible. The property is set up to access all of that area without being impactful. Um, we don't do this just winging it and, and not thinking about anything. We're, we know our deer. So... Not to discount what this gentleman was saying. Maybe in his area, his deer are terrified you can't slam the car door. You'll never see a deer again. That's in true. In your area, deer don't, they don't really care that much. My area, but I have I have too many dogs. And they bark all night long. They howl every time the train comes by. I live two, 300 yards off the railroad tracks. I got deer walking around my backyard all the time. They don't care. Right. Well, and that's what we do when we do the consulting is... We're going to ask you a million questions about your deer to try to understand the deer. Mm -hmm. We're going to walk the property with you to so you can point out these things so we can see the train track or we can see the, the bedding area. And we're going to ask you all of that stuff so we can try to understand your deer. What can be getting away? Because my land, I can do I can do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. But on your land, we might have to do ABC because that's what they're conditioned to do. Or we're going to try to adapt that conditioning so that you and, can now do more like us. And that's a thing you can do. It's just a longer process. You can you always have to condition know the deer. And you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Because the I go up and I feed them the same way every time around the same time. It's the process. And the moment you alleviate from that, if I walked up there rather than drive, and I went up there an hour later, I'm probably going to see the deer. The deer are not going to be happy with me, and they're going to bail. Mm -hmm. I've just educated them. I've just freaked them out. So consistency is so important once you're set up. Now, I'm going in one time to do hinge cutting. We made an absolute mess of it last year. We did hinge cutting, food plots, tree stands, skid steers, chainsaw. You know, we, we cleared trails. We made a mess. Mm -hmm. But now we're into the, okay, this is how it's going to be every day. Don't worry about it. Relax. Come in. Enjoy yourself. Eat now. Sleep later. Sleep over here. Eat right here. That side by side. I don't worry about that side by side. That that's that's not a big deal. So, so yeah, do what you can to help your deer and know your deer. That's the most important thing. Uh, but we were running almost an hour and twenty minutes. So nice. Longer than we planned on going, but uh, we covered a lot of good ground. So, unless you got anything else you want to say, I think we're cut it off here. No, look, uh, look forward to this is coming out. Actually, we're doing this today. It's, it's coming out today. Noon, yep. And it's coming out at 7 o'clock. Um, but, yeah, look for next week. We're going to have a, another special guest, I hope, Jared. And we're going to talk about how he shoots 150-plus inch deer every year. So there we go. So sounds good. Thank you guys for joining us and listening all the way through. We will be back next Friday at 7 p.m. For another episode of Lessons of the Woods, hopefully with our special guest. 
and uh, we'll keep you guys posted. Follow us on Facebook. You can follow us on YouTube. Find us on our, your favorite podcast apps if you want the audio-only versions. Uh, yeah, find us where you found us. We'll see you guys next time.